Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So in the last class we saw um, how the entropy changes are calculated during an irreversible process and uh, uh, most importantly we saw that interdiffusion is an irreversible process. It basically drives the system from non-equilibrium state to an equilibrium state. So how do we define an equilibrium state? We have seen before in terms of entropy and internal energy we can define the equilibrium state. So at constant internal energy and volume the equilibrium state corresponds to the maximum entropy or at constant entropy and volume the equilibrium state corresponds to minimum internal energy. Okay. So, that means to define equilibrium state in terms of S and V we need to select the independent variable. So, in terms of S we need to select U and V as independent variable or in terms of u we need to select s and v as independent variables. Now, this pair of variables are not really convenient to handle. Imagine you are carrying out certain process in which you want to keep volume constant and vary internal energy systematically or you want to keep volume constant and vary entropy systematically right or you want to control the entropy the which is which looks really difficult right. So, these are not really convenient variable to handle and so we need to define the criteria of equilibrium in terms of variables which are easily manageable which are easily controllable by us. Which are those variables? Temperature, pressure and volume more specifically temperature and pressure right. And so, we need to define other state functions which can define the criteria of equilibrium in terms of these variables okay. and that is how the uh, next state functions are defined. There are three more state functions enthalpy which we defined as U plus P V, Helmholtz free energy which we define as U minus T S and Gibbs free energy which we defined as H minus T S. So, let us analyze them one by one. Let us try to see what independent variables we can use in order to be able to use this new state functions for criteria of equilibrium. For example, if Z is a function, let us try to derive the equation in terms of dz equal to dou z by dou x at constant y dx plus dou z by dou y at constant x dy. So, we know x and y are here independent variables right. So, if we take the differential of h here dh is equal to du plus p dv plus v dp and by the combination of first law and second law we know du is equal to T d s minus P d v plus P d v plus V d p and so d h is equal to this gets cancelled T d s plus V d p right which we can write in the form do h by do s at constant P d s plus do h by do p at constant s d p. So, by definition the partial of h with respect to entropy becomes t or partial of h with respect to pressure becomes volume v. Right? So, we know h can be expressed as a function of s and p and we can show then at constant s and p
equilibrium state corresponds to minimum enthalpy okay so we got a criteria of equilibrium in terms of edge but again this is not very convenient so let's try to figure out what happens with a so if you take the differential of a you have du minus t ds minus s d t substitute for du t d s minus p d v t d s minus s d t is equal to it cancel minus s d t minus p d v and so we know that a can be expressed as a function of t and v and with this we can express the criteria of equilibrium. So, at constant temperature and volume equilibrium state corresponds to minimum in Helmholtz free energy. So, let us try to apply it to G also since G is equal to H minus T S D G is equal to D H minus T D S minus S D T and d h we know is equal to plus t d s plus v d p minus t d s minus s d t and so d g is equal to minus s d t plus v d p. So, now we have a state function which can be expressed as a function of t and p and the criteria of equilibrium becomes at constant T and P equilibrium state corresponds to minimum in G, G is the Gibbs free energy. Okay. So, now this is convenient we have Helmholtz free energy if we want to use temperature and volume as the independent variables we can use Gibbs free energy to define criteria of equilibrium if we want to use temperature and pressure as independent variables. So, both are important right? through the experimentalist perspective as an experimentalist we usually handle temperature and pressure as independent variables right. For example, when we carry out isothermal diffusion experiments or annealing at constant temperature right. So, we are defining I want the annealing temperature to be let us say 800 degree centigrade and most of the time we assume the pressure is at one atmosphere right. So, that means we are using temperature and pressure as independent variables. So, we need to use Gibbs free energy as our criteria for equilibrium. So, for experimentalist Gibbs free energy is a very important state function, but through the theoreticians perspective they would like to use Helmholtz free energy because they would like to keep volume constant and the reason is by keeping volume constant the energy levels are fixed right. So, the theoreticians will use Helmholtz free energy A for the criteria of equilibrium right. So, for this class we will most of the time using temperature and pressure as independent variables. So, we will now focus on the Gibbs free energy. Okay. So, in terms of all these variables now we have developed the what we call as equations of state right. So, in terms of internal energy or entropy we define d u is equal to T d s minus P d v d h is equal to T d s plus V d p d a is equal to minus S d t minus P d v and d g is equal to minus S d t plus V d p. Now, so far we have assumed constant composition throughout our analysis we did not let the composition of the system change 
but what if the composition changes? So, we know that all these state functions u, s, h, a, g, they are all extensive properties, which means they depend upon the size of the system. So, when we allow the change in composition, then we need to also take into account the number of moles of each of the species. So, for example, instead of expressing g as a just a function of g, t and p, we need to write g as a function of t, p and number of moles of all the components. Right? So, the differential of g is expressed as dou g by dou t at constant pressure and composition d t plus dou g by dou t at constant temperature and composition by dou p d p plus partial of g with respect to number of moles of i at constant temperature pressure and all other number of moles partial of g with respect to number of moles of j at constant temperature pressure and all other number of moles i not equal to j and so on and now this partial is an important quantity right so what is this partial basically it expresses the change in Gibbs free energy because of addition of 1 mole of I at constant temperature, pressure and constant number of moles of other species and this is called as chemical potential. Right? So, the chemical potential of I is defined as dou g by dou n i constant temperature pressure and all n j is not equal to i. Now, we have to remember that chemical potential is also a function of composition. right? So, when you make this addition of 1 mole of i, the composition of the material should not change. So, when we define this chemical potential, the addition of 1 mole of I is done to a large bulk of the material such that addition of 1 mole of I does not change the composition significantly. Okay. You can express this either in terms of per mole or per atom. So, if N i is number of moles, this is joules per mole. If you express in terms of atom, how much gives you energy changes? by addition of one atom of I at constant temperature, pressure and constant number of atoms of all other elements. That is, then it will be joule per atom. Okay. And this is an important quantity in our class of on interdiffusion. As I mentioned in the last class, the fundamental driving force for diffusion is the gradient in chemical potentials. So, you need to understand this. Now, with this, we can modify our equations of state to take into account the changes in composition as d g is equal to minus s d t plus v d p plus mu i d n i and the summation goes over all the components i equal to 1 to n. So, one more thing uh, quickly this chemical potential can also be defined in terms of Helmholtz free energy or enthalpy or even internal energy. Right? So, you in, in terms of internal energy, you can define as change in internal energy due to addition of 1 mole of I and we know U is a function of S and V. So, at constant entropy volume and N j not equal to I or it can also be equally defined as change in Helmholtz free energy and A is a function of T and V 
do a by do n i at constant t v and n j not equal to i or change in enthalpy h which is a function of s and p. So, at constant s p and n j not equal to i. So, now we know how to define the equation of state even when there is a uh, change in composition. Now, this change in composition may be because of two things right. The first way, way the change in composition is brought about is you allow the system to be open system. So, the mass can be exchanged and obviously, the composition will change, but even within a closed system during a particular uh, reaction or during a particular transformation right, the composition of different phases can change right. So, all that will be taken into account if we apply this new equation of state which considers the chemical potentials. Okay. So, now with that uh, we also know the criteria for equilibrium in terms of Gibbs free energy. We will now next move to the stability because that is our main interest to define the stability of different phases. Okay. So, for example, if I consider a process at constant T and P. I know I need to use Gibbs free energy as the criteria for equilibrium and if I tract Gibbs free energy as a function of some arbitrary unit for example, atomic arrangement. So, if I continuously change atomic arrangements at constant T and P and see how the Gibbs free energy changes, I may get some variations schematically like this. Okay. So, I need to define now which is the stable state. Right. So, how many equilibrium states are here? Right. So, we know for equilibrium the Gibbs free energy has to be minimum. So, locally we see there are three minima. Right. So, let us denote them by A, B and C. So, there are three equilibrium states A, B and C. How many stable states are there? Right. So, there is only one stable state and which corresponds to the global minimum in the Gibbs free energy right? and that is B. So, the stable state here is stable state here is B. A and C are equilibrium states, right? but they are not stable state. The criteria for stability is the Gibbs free energy has to reach the global minimum and global minimum here is B. A and C are referred to as metastable state. They are called metastable because during a particular process or during a particular transformation, since the Gibbs free energy there is minimum those states can be realized temporarily. Now, the temporarily time frame will depend upon the kinetics. Right? So, for example, what is the uh, example that you know of a metastable state? Diamond or in steels we have uh, martensite. Right? So, typically iron at room temperature will exist as BCC or mild steel the low temperature uh, stable uh, phase is BCC or alpha. But if you quench it fast you see austenite instead of transforming to alpha it will transform to martensite and that martensite is a metastable phase. So, which means that over certain amount of time it will eventually transform to BCC. But since the kinetics are very slow, so it takes very long time. So, you feel as if the martensite is a stable phase, that is why it is called a metastable phase. But ultimately, it will transform to the final equilibrium state. 
Okay, so that is the difference between stability and equilibrium. Equilibrium, we just say that Gibbs free energy is minimum at constant T and P. For stability, the Gibbs free energy has to reach global minimum. So, the phase which has the least Gibbs free energy among all possible phases will be the stable phase. Now, there may be more than one phases which have the same Gibbs free energy and which happens to be the global minimum in the Gibbs free energy. In that case, both the phases are stable. So, we say that the two phases coexist in equilibrium. Okay. So, now let us see what drives the transformations and for that we need to analyze the Gibbs free energy as a function of temperature and pressure. So, first let us try to look at how the Gibbs free energy varies first with temperature at constant pressure then with pressure at constant temperature and then we will see if we vary both how the Gibbs free energy changes. Okay. So, let us first try to look at how the Gibbs free energy changes with temperature at constant pressure. We know that d g is equal to minus s d t plus v d p and to start with we are analyzing single component systems which means the composition is constant. Now, the single component system means the system contains only one component that component may be a pure element or it may be a chemical species or a molecule which does not dissociate over the range of temperature and pressures that we are studying. And for example, water if you want to analyze the uh, phase transformations in water how it transforms from ice to water, water to vapor and there is no reaction occurring or no decomposition of water occurring then we use water as a single component system. Okay. So, since at constant composition, so we do not need to include uh, mu i d and i terms and we want to analyze uh, how the Gibbs free energy varies with temperature at constant pressure. So, what will be the slope of the plot? Slope means variation of g with respect to temperature at constant pressure from this equation the slope should be equal to minus s and entropy is always positive right. So, the slope of g versus t curve has to be negative. Now, what will be the curvature? Curvature is the second derivative that is basically dou s by dou t negative and what is dou s by dou t? Minus C p by t again C p is positive t is positive always we are considering remember the temperature in Kelvin the thermodynamic temperature scale. So, temperature is always positive and so the curvature should also be negative. So, the schematically the plot will look like this. So, as the temperature increases Gibbs free energy decreases, Gibbs free energy of a phase or of a system decreases with temperature. What about variation of G with P? at constant temperature so again if we try to see the slope dou g by dou p at constant t from the equation of state here we know its volume and volume is al always positive so the slope should be greater than 0 and the curvature which is the second derivative should be dou v by dou p at constant t is negative or positive negative right. So, at constant temperature if you increase the pressure the volume will decrease. So, the dou v by dou p is negative and so the curvature is less than 0. 
So, if you try to plot g versus p at constant t schematically it will have a shape something like this. Now, let us try to analyze the phase changes in the context of Gibbs free energy change. right? So, let us consider transformation of solid to liquid. So, let us denote the Gibbs free energy of solid as G s, Gibbs free energy of liquid as G l. So, if we plot at constant pressure, if we plot G versus T, if we see how the Gibbs free energy of solid and liquid changes. So, obviously, I know the kind of shape of the two curves. So, I draw one curve for solid, one curve for liquid. Okay. The one that I drew first is solid and the second one is <coughs> liquid. Why? How do you know? From the slopes, right? Because we know the slope of G versus T is minus s and entropy is a major of disorder right and we know the solid is more order than liquid right so the entropy of solid is lesser than liquid so the slope of g versus t curve is higher negative for liquid than for solid so they will intersect at some point and this is the equilibrium melting point tm so at any temperature below tm we know the gibbs free energy of solid is less than that of liquid and so solid is stable equilibrium means uh, both solid and liquid are in equilibrium at that time. So, like here, so I will talk about it now. See, at T equal to T m, we have the Gibbs free energy of solid is equal to Gibbs free energy of liquid, right. So, at exactly T m, T equal to T m, at this particular pressure that we are considering, the Gibbs free energy of both solid and liquid is same. So, both are stable phases, that is why we say that solid is in equilibrium with liquid and this is denoted as equilibrium melting point. Okay. So, at T equal to T m solid in equilibrium with liquid. At T greater than T m G l is less than G s and so liquid is stable. Okay. Suppose we could cool the water below T equal to T m, let us say at this temperature, let us say at T 1. So, we know at T 1 G liquid is greater than G solid, right. So, liquid is an unstable phase. So, it has to transform to a stable phase which is solid. So, liquid to solid transformation will occur irreversibly. So, there is an irreversible freezing of the liquid because it is associated with decrease in Gibbs free energy. Right. So, if you calculate delta G for this change liquid to solid here, it will be final state minus initial state G s minus G l is less than 0. So, the change decrease in Gibbs free energy is a driving force for this freezing here. Similarly, if we could hit this solid to a temperature greater than T m. we know that 
Now, solid has a higher Gibbs free energy and it has to transform to liquid. So, there will be an irreversible melting. So, delta G for solid to liquid here will be G L minus G S again less than 0 and so at T 2 there will be an irreversible melting. But at exactly T equal to T m both Gibbs free energies are same. So, there is no driving force right. So, both phases are stable. So, by any chance if you start with completely uh, solid phase and if you heat it to T equal to T m and stop there what should happen exactly at T equal to T m the solid will remain as solid because there is no driving force only when you try to increase the temperature some solid will transform to liquid. Similarly, if you cool the liquid from T 2 slowly to temperature T m and stop there what will happen? The liquid will not immediately transform to solid. If you stop then the liquid will remain as liquid at T m because liquid is also stable at T m. Only when you try to cool further then the liquid will transform to solid. Okay. So, exactly at T equal to T m delta G is equal to 0 and at constant T and P we can write delta G as delta H minus T delta S and so delta S is equal to delta H over T m. So, this T is T m there is an equilibrium melting point or equilibrium melting temperature at a given temperature. If I change the pressure how the equilibrium will shift right. So, in other words if I change the pressure and if I still want to maintain the equilibrium between solid and liquid which way the temperature should change ok. So, let us uh, try to analyze that. So, at equilibrium we know that G s is equal to G l. Now, we are changing the state, but we are still maintaining the equilibrium between solid and liquid. So, whatever change in Gibbs free energy of solid, the same change in Gibbs free energy of liquid should accompany right. So, we can write D G s is equal to D G l and if we substitute for d g you know minus s s d t plus v s d p is equal to minus s l d t plus v l d p and if we rearrange we write d p by d t is equal to delta s by delta v and at equilibrium we know delta S is equal to delta H by T delta V. Right? So, this is the Clausius Clapeyron equation. So, now more specifically we denote this as dP by dT equilibrium why because we are observing if I change the temperature a little bit and still maintain the equilibrium between the two phases how much change in pressure has to be carried out or if I change the pressure a little bit and still want to maintain the equilibrium between the two phases or which way the temperature should change. Now, this we analyze for solid to liquid or liquid to solid, but this is equally applicable for any transformation. So, if we know delta H and delta V, we should be able to know which way the temperature should be shifted. So, for example, let us try to analyze the melting of ice. Right? So, for melting of ice, we know ice to water transformation what should be delta H? H water 
minus h i s should be positive or negative positive right because higher temperature phase will have higher enthalpy and that appears in the latent heat of uh, fusion right so heat is absorbed because water has higher enthalpy so this is positive greater than 0 what about delta v molar volume of water minus molar volume of ice it should be negative or positive normally for melting the volume will increase right because liquid phase will have higher volume than solid phase right but for water it's reverse right because ice has lower density than water around uh, near to 0 degree celsius right so because of that the melting will be associated with reduction in volume water will have lower volume than ice and so delta vm is less than 0 so basically for uh, melting dp by dt right for melting of ice is negative which means if i increase the pressure the equilibrium melting point should be reduced and this is the reason why ice skating becomes possible right when the skater is skating there is certain pressure applied on the ice and because of that pressure the melting point which is in contact with the skate uh, comes down and so the water uh, melts and there is a thin layer of water that forms between the ice and the skate and it helps the skating it acts as a lubrication what is another example can also consider the water to vapor transformation right or boiling of water now here what will be delta h obviously positive because water converting to vapor vapor has higher enthalpy what about delta v should also be positive obviously the vapor has higher molar volume than water and so dp by dt is greater than 0 so if we decrease the pressure the equilibrium boiling point should decrease right? and that is the reason at higher altitude the boiling point of water comes down right so if you try to cook rice at higher altitude it's difficult right at higher altitude the atmospheric pressure is lower and so the equilibrium boiling point of water reduces if you try to cook rice in open uh, uh, pot the water will start boiling before the rice is cooked right and that is why you have to use pressure cooker right? in pressure cooker you can maintain the pressure near to one atmosphere and then easy to cook rice okay so these are the examples this is a very useful equation because we can use this to develop phase diagrams so what we are doing here basically is tracking how the equilibrium shifts if I make some changes in temperature or pressure. So, if you plot the locus of pressure and temperature at which the equilibrium exists, you are basically plotting the boundary between the two phases and that is what you need in the phase diagram. right? So, for example, you can consider the phase diagram of water so, for single component system, we draw the phase diagram as a pressure versus temperature. So, for water, for example, this is how the phase diagram for water looks like. So, there are different regions this is solid ice, this is liquid or water and this is gaseous region or vapor now if you look at this curve let us call this oa it is the boundary between solid region and liquid region and exactly along ao the solid and liquid two phases exist in equilibrium right so this is basically the equilibrium melting 
Now you can see from the clausius clapeyron equation that we saw seen earlier, right? dP by dt is negative for solid to liquid transformation in water and so this line has a negative slope. But solid liquid to vapor or boiling which is this line let us call this OB, it has a positive slope. Similarly, solid to vapor has a positive slope. Now you can see this three curves intersect at one point O. That means at this point all three phases coexist in equilibrium and this is the triple point. So, at triple point solid, liquid and vapor all three phases coexist in equilibrium. So, this is at around 0 0.0075 degree centigrade and 0 0.006 atmosphere. Okay, so, if we try to plot, uh, let us say G versus T for water at constant pressure of 0 0.006 atmosphere, how would it be? Now, we have three phases, three possible phases, so we need three curves. So, if we see at 0 0.0086 atmosphere, as we increase the temperature, what happens? First, the solid is stable at low temperature, then as we keep heating at 0 0.0075 degree centigrade, we reach the point O, which is the triple point. So, all three phases are in equilibrium and then we enter the vapor region. So, basically at point O, the Gibbs free energy of solid is equal to Gibbs free energy of liquid is equal to Gibbs free energy of vapor. When I say this Gibbs free energy, I, these are basically the molar Gibbs free energy, right? As Gibbs free energy is an extensive quantity. So, I am talking about molar Gibbs free energies. So, the molar Gibbs free energies of solid, liquid and vapor are equal at 0 0.006 atmosphere and 0 0.0075 degree centigrade. So, I will have three curves which intersect at one point, right? So, if I draw these three curves, let us say one for solid, one for liquid and then one for vapor. So, all three curves should pass through one point or intersect at one point O and this is the triple point. So, at temperature below this solid stable, at temperature above this vapor stable and exactly at the temperature equal to triple point temperature, all three Gibbs free energies are equal. Okay? So, this is how we can develop the single component phase diagram based upon the Gibbs free energy changes. All right, any question? So, we will stop here for today.